Good morning. morning. In our spiritual battles, there are few pieces of armor as useful as the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I don't know if you have ever been face to face with the devil himself. But Jesus was, and he wielded that sword of the Spirit. It is written, it is written, it is written. Jesus faced his deepest, darkest spiritual battles with the Word of God. We've sung about the Word of God today. He said, give me the Bible. We've sung, thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. This word is able to satisfy our souls. This word teaches us to walk in the very ways of God. This word gives us words with which to praise our God and call on his name. That's quite something. The psalm writer said, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. The word hidden in the heart fortifies the soul against sin. It fortifies our heart with strength. The psalm writer said a number of things. Listen to these verses selected from Psalm 119. Longest chapter in the Bible. The psalm writer said, I rejoice in following your statutes as one who rejoices in great riches. You know, a lot of people around us, they say, wow, you know, I'd love to just make a little more money. There's a desire for wealth and riches, which is proclaimed as, a, uh, as the way to go in life. But the psalm writer is saying, far, better, far more than rejoicing in, re- in great riches, I rejoice in following your word. What about this? My soul is consumed with longing for your laws at all times. What consumes your soul? From the time you get up in the morning to the time you go to bed at night, what is at the core of what you are pursuing? For the psalm writer, he was consumed with longing for the word of God. Your statutes are my delight. They are my counselors. When you need guidance, when you need advice, when you need help, where do we go? The internet. (laughs) I need answers, so we type in Google. Well, the psalm writer says, I delight in your word. Your word is my counsel. Your statutes are my counselors. The psalm writer says, turn my eyes away from worthless things. We can look around us and say, you know, what's it all worth?
Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. What about this? May your unfailing love come to me, O Lord. Your salvation according to your promise. Then I will answer the one who taunts me. For I trust in your word. Do you have any enemies? Are they taunting you? The psalm writer says, O Lord, your salvation, your unfailing love comes to me according to your promise. The words of the scriptures assure us that God is our ever-present help in time of need. The psalm writer says, your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Your faithfulness continues throughout all generations. You established the earth and it endures. Your laws endure to this day. For all things serve you. A few more verses from this chapter. Now, the psalm writer says, Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are with me. Now, you could wrestle with that. Uh, if we had facility in Hebrew, we could say, okay, so who is with me? It says, well, your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are with me. Are the commands with me or are my enemies with me? You could wrestle with that. This is why it's great to be able to know the original languages, but if you don't, it helps to occasionally have some commentaries or have other translations which are reliable translations so you can compare and read the context. You just might get an insight or two. And then read the verses in front and behind the verses that you are reading. Not everything we read in the scriptures is clear at first reading. Even Jesus sat among the teachers of the law and asked them questions. And Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature, in favor with God and people. And so it is we are to become wise in the scriptures. We are to wrestle with the scriptures. Nobody said it was easy to study the scriptures. It takes devotion. It takes time. It takes a willingness to sit under the scriptures, and to meditate on it, to make it our treasure. And that takes time, that takes devotion. The psalm writer says, oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands, okay, I'll, I'll let you decide whether he's being boastful here or not. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are with me. I have more insight than all my teachers. Why? For I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders. For I obey your precepts. I have kept my feet from every path so that I may obey your word. I have not departed from your laws. For you, yourself, have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste. Sweeter than honey to my mouth. 
I gain understanding from your precepts. Therefore, I hate every wrong path. Devotion to the words of Scripture, to the Word of God, can make us, can give us wisdom. Wisdom that can even exceed that of earthly teachers. It can keep us from every evil path, from every wrong path. What a treasure we have in the Scriptures. What blood has been shed to preserve this book? What efforts have been made to translate it into every language under heaven? You can go down to the Museum of the Bible and you can see lists, well not just lists, but they have a representative book with the language on it. So you can go into this room and see all of, the, all of the languages, all of the known languages into which the scriptures or portions thereof have been translated. And like turning on lights, it's like there's light here, light here, light here, light here, light here. The lights are turning on. They're being translated into many different languages. But there are still languages into which the scriptures have not yet been translated. So they are not able to have the scriptures as a lamp to their feet or a light for their path in their own language. So some have devoted their lives to the task of translating the scriptures into other languages. What a story of transmission how people have devoted themselves to printing and to preserving and to recording and to distributing through apps and every creating billboards and even creating uh, games and other ways of spreading the scriptures. What a potential for life transformation for all who receive this word and do what it says. For all who have the blessing of opening the word, hearing the word, receiving the word, and living their lives according to the word. We learn that the Bible is food. We do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. It is sweeter than honey and drippings from the honeycomb. It can also be bitter to the stomach as the truth of its word is applied to our innermost being. As the word of God comes powerfully into our lives, it may cause us to Be cut to the quick. It it may affect our conscience if our conscience has not been deadened. The word of God isn't always pleasant to hear. It does indeed divide to the very soul and spirit, joints and marrow, judging the thoughts and attitude of the heart. So if the Bible is food, it is also fire. Through the prophet Jeremiah, God asked, Is not my word like fire? Fire can both consume and renew life. For Jeremiah, the word of God was like fire in his bones that he could not contain. The Bible is also faith producing. Faith comes from hearing the message of the scriptures. The words of the scriptures have been written down, read publicly, reasoned from, translated, transmitted, preserved through many generations of turmoil, 
the scriptures have made possibly, or have made possible, a collective memory of the kingdom of God. Uh, we have continuity with those who have gone before us. And though the languages of this earth have changed over the years, the story has been preserved over many generations. We are told that faith comes from hearing the word. Paul encouraged his son Timothy, his son in the faith Timothy, to be faithful to the task of preaching the word, to being prepared in season and out of season, to correct, to rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. He said, because there will come a time when people will gather teachers around them to hear what they want to hear. So Paul needed to be faithful to the task of preaching the word. To the Christians at Rome, Paul wrote the following. He said, we who are strong in faith should be patient with the weak, with their weaknesses, and not only please ourselves. Let each of us please our neighbors for their good and help them be stronger in their faith. Now the word here is that they might be edified, to edify them, which means to build them up. Even Christ did not live to please himself, Paul says. It was, as the scripture said, when people insult you, it hurts me. Literally, the insults of those who insulted you have fallen on me. And Paul writes, he says, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. The scriptures give us patience, endurance, encouragement, so that we might have hope. He says, may the patience and encouragement that come from God allow you to live in harmony with each other the way Jesus Christ wants wants you to, and then you will all be joined together. That you with one voice and one mouth will be able to give glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's amazing what the scriptures can do. It can unite brothers and sisters in the faith. It can give hope. It can give encouragement. Paul says, accept one another just as Christ accepted you. And therefore bring glory to God. So the scriptures are not merely for our own benefit. It is for our collective benefit that we might live in unity of the faith. And that we might be united in hope. What was written in the past was written to teach us. What was written in the past was written to encourage us. What was written in the past was written to unite us. What was written in the past was written that we might give glory to God. You might say, Eric, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. I, I think the scriptures are a good thing. Oh, well, but there's even more than that. The scriptures proclaim an important message. The scriptures proclaim that God is with us. It tells a story about how we are created to walk in fellowship with God. Do not be afraid. I am with you. Do not be dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you by my righteous right hand. Think about that. God is with us. Not only do the scriptures proclaim that God is with us, the Bible also proclaims that God is for us. 
And if God is for us, who can stand against us? The scriptures explain how God has been at work rescuing, redeeming, and restoring us to a right relationship with him. The scriptures describe how to live out this life with God. So, the Bible is food, fire, faith producing, and proclaim that God is for us. Now, despite all of these benefits, despite all of these wonderful things that the Word of God does for us, the Word of God is also easily forgotten. What? Wait a minute. Wait, if the Bible is truly all of this stuff, how could we let it slip from our hearts? But indeed, this has been what has happened throughout the generations. One generation will be zealous for God, and then it seems just a short period of time before the word of God is forgotten. It seems almost ironic that in the days of Josiah, they were doing repairs in the temple, and they come to King Josiah, King of Judah, and they say, we have found the, the book of God. And they read it in his presence, and Josiah tore his clothes because he realized that his generation had not followed the covenant that God had established. And based on that reading of the scriptures, he continued to do the reforms as God had laid out. But the, the people's hearts had turned away from the word of God and, and had followed after idols. As it was in that period of time, so it happens in any generation when we fail to store the word of God, not only in the temples or in the churches, but in our very hearts. So books are remarkable things. We can think, well, what's so special about a book? I mean, it doesn't look particularly dangerous. And indeed, if, if it's not in our language, or we don't know how to read, or, or we don't hear it, it can't have an effect on our lives. I was trying to remember picture a time, I was trying to remember what it was like for me to learn how to read. I think I was blessed uh, from an early age that my parents provided me books. So my parents encouraged us to read from an early age. Uh, so it was only just a, a few years into life that I was able to read. And I, I remember, in our, I, I would imagine the tables were about this, this high, but I remember like first grade, we would, we would gather around and we would learn how to read. The teacher would teach us how to read. And I remember times uh, in going to the library and we would all be sitting on the floor and, and the the librarian would be opening up a book and, and reading it to us. And how exciting and how amazing that was. And then to be able to read for myself, to be able to go to the shelf and take, take a book and explore and go to different worlds and learn about different topics and, and receive it. How exciting is that? And then I became a bookaholic. <laughs> Spent all my money on books. It's only a slight exaggeration. And now I realize there are more books to read than we could ever have time to read. And you can be crazy about it. But we do have one book which we can't forget. And praise God 
The Lord has given us this book, and we must treasure it. We must hold on to it. We must hide it in our hearts, but not just hide it in our hearts. We must work it out into our lives. We must spur one another on to love and good deeds. How? Through preaching the word, through teaching the word, through being learners of Jesus, who gave us an example because the word is about Jesus. Someone said, those who can't read are not much worse off than those who, those who don't read. So we have a great privilege in having the word translated into our language in many different versions. We may almost have the curse of too many options. We've got the paradox of choice. It's like, well, where do we begin? How do we approach this? It's like, how many chapters a day do I read? What version do I read it in? When do I read it? Where do I start? Blah, 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 blah. And you could get crazy about it all. Well, thankfully, God brings the church. There's, there's a place for the church. And I think that's why it's important that as we read the scriptures and as we learn them and as we read and grow together, we spur one another on with love and good deeds. We teach we don't read the scriptures in isolation. And that's where God blesses us with brothers and sisters who have particular insights into the word. And we realize that while it may be complicated and while there may be some passages that are difficult to understand, really, when you see the whole big picture, it makes sense. There's a tremendous continuity. And it's not so much what we don't understand, but it's what we do understand. We have plenty that we do understand to put into practice. So sure, no, nobody will say that it's always easy to understand the scriptures. I mean, after all, it was written over thousands of years in different cultures that are separate from us by not many years, but also many customs and a different language. But, but that being the case, you can't but reading, you can't but help read the scriptures and realize, you know what? I have hope today because I see that even the people of God didn't always have it together. When I see how clueless the disciples of Jesus himself could be, I said, well, you know what? Maybe our time isn't is messed up, or maybe it's not too messed up. All you have to do is go back um, to Cor uh, the Corinthian letters and say, well, you know, they had it pretty bad themselves, so if there was hope for them, there was hope for us as well. So we see that there is continuity over the years, and there is hope. So we do not read the scriptures in isolation. Praise God for that. And praise God for times such as today, when we can, even for just a moment or two, devote ourselves to the public reading of Scripture. Yes, praise God, I think most, if not, I would say almost everybody, even the kids who are here today can read. Thank God for that. We have the blessing of being able to read the word in our own language, and we must not take that for granted. We must not take the easy availability of the word for granted, but we must indeed devote ourselves not only to the public reading of Scripture, but since we have the opportunity to devote ourselves to the private reading of Scripture, to the hiding of the word in our hearts, and to the meditating of the word in our hearts. Well, there is much to be said about this. As we will spend a few more weeks on this theme of He restores my soul, today we've looked 
for a few moments on this concept of he restores my soul through the scriptures. When we ask ourselves, what can we hold on to? What is worth building my life on? We can build our lives on the foundation set out for us in the scriptures. The person who delights in the word, who delights in the scripture, is like a tree planted by streams of water whose leaf does not wither, and whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Jesus said, whoever hears these words of mine and does them will be like the wise man who built his house on the rock. We all know the song. The rains came down, the floods came up. And the wise man's house stood firm. Not so the wicked. They built their house on the sand. The rains came down, the floods came up, beat against that house, and that man's house went crash. Because it was not built on a solid foundation. May we hear the word. May we read the word. May we study the word. May we memorize the word. May we meditate on the word. May we be doers of the word. Let's pray. Our Father, we pray that you will renew us. There seem to be so many distractions in our world, so many things that take us away from that which is essential. We pray, O oh God, that you will indeed help us not merely to be hearers of the word, but doers as well. And help us to see in the light of your word, your presence among us. And that we can hear in your word your calling on our lives. Forgive us when we turn from your word to things that pass away. Hear our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When the walls of Jerusalem were broken down, when the peoples were taken into exile, but then God returned Israel to Jerusalem. They rebuilt the walls, but then once the walls were rebuilt, they made sure to gather the people together, and then they read from the word of God for much of a day. And the people devoted themselves to that word. God restored his people to their land. And as we hear the word and as we respond to it, God can put our lives back together again. God can also renew our lives, and then God can also take a life that is blessed and very good and send it out on his mission. And, and praise God we are not alone in this pursuit, and praise God that we do not bear our struggles alone. I know from knowing a bit about most of the people in this room but there are a lot of struggles represented here. Some deep burdens, deep burdens, deep pains. Um, praise God that we do not bear our burdens alone and that we are called to build each other up and bear one another's burdens and pray for one another. So if, if we can be of encouragement to you, please don't bear your burden alone. You don't have to share your prayer request publicly. You can share it with the brother or sister whom you trust, but make sure you don't bear your burden alone. I know many of you are really struggling right now. Now, if you have some, something to rejoice with, well, praise God for that. Let us celebrate with you on that. Now, maybe you've heard the word, and maybe you've heard it for many years, and, 
and somehow the word has convicted you, and you realize, I'm not a Christian, but I want to be a Christian. I want to be baptized with Christ and to rise to walk in newness of life. If the word has done that in your heart and the spirit is calling you to become a Christian today, now is the day to do that. Whatever your desire might be, please make it known as we stand and sing the song of invitation. Please turn.